yeah, the, the guidelines, the EA guidelines are updated yearly. So there are several topics that will change in the 2019 version based on the available literature. Uh, to summarize the main changes, let's say the first one was for upfront MRI before biopsy. We came to the conclusion that uh, before biopsy an MRI is needed and should be done every time. But every time, not for screening, every time a biopsy is considered based on risks. Uh, then the, 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 the decision to take with the MRI depending on where we are. If it's a first biopsy, it was strongly suggest to perform if the MRI is abnormal, that is a pyrus lesion 3 or above, to biopsy the lesion plus to perform systematic biopsy. We do not believe we are enough data yet to avoid the systematic biopsies. On the other side, if the MRI is negative, that is pyrus 2, 1 or normal, we have to think about doing a biopsy, yes or no, based on the risk of the patient, based on the DRA or and the PSA and the familiar history. That is a risk calculator that might be used. And it must be a shared decision not to go for biopsy with the patients. That for the, pre -bi for the pre biopsy MRI for the first time. If the patient already had a normal MRI and a normal biopsy before, then it's a little bit different. If the MRI is positive, we strongly suggest to go for biopsy and probably targeted biopsy are enough and probably it's safe to avoid systematic biopsy on top of them. On the opposite, if the MRI is normal, same definition as before, again it's a shared decision based on the risk factors using a, a, a risk factor calculation tool. There are several that might be useful. That's the main change we had, the first one. The second we had is about the definition of relapse and how to deal with the relapse. And this is based on uh, nothing special that was published, but on a formal, formal systematic review that was conducted at the guideline office on that. And they were, we were tried to answer two questions that transferred into the guidelines. The first one is, if there's a link between survival and relapse, which sounds to be trivial, but it's far from being so trivial. And the answer is yes but the link is very heterogeneous. You have some relapse where the risk, relative risk of death is something around 1.03, meaning almost no increased risk of death. And there are some other relapse where the, the relative risk is more than 2 point something, 2.3 or 2.4, if I remember well. Meaning that these relapse are at a very high risk of death if not treated. This has led us to the second question, uh, can we stratify those relapse at risk and those at very low risk? And yes, we can, again, based on the evidence. For the high risk, the relapse at high risk, it's a patient that had an early relapse, that is a relapse between 18, 12 to 18 months after the, the end of the local treatment, or have an ISIP score above four, or equal to four, that is Gleason eight to 10, or probably or even more important is a PSA doubling time that is less than 12 months. And this is correct even for surgery or radiotherapy. And for those relapse, they are high risk relapse and they should be treated. On the opposite, the low risk relapse are those relapse late, who have an, an ISIP score of less than four, that is Gleason seven and below. And even more important again is the PSA doubling time with a doubling time of more than 12 months. In this case, the link between relapse and death is marginal, if any. And the added value of any form of salvage treatment must be balanced by the side effects you create when you use it and the very long-term benefit that so far is purely hypothetical, suggesting that for those relapse of low risk, the need to receive salvage form of treatment is marginal. That's the second major point I want to highlight regarding guidelines. The third one is a non-metastatic CRPC, something completely new, and this is a major change based on two randomized trials that are available before we finalize the text. Later on, a third one appeared, and now we have three trials showing exactly the same thing. For the patient with M0 CRPC and a very rapidly growing PSA, that is a PSA doubling time of less than 10 months, adding either enzalutamide or apalutamide 
or darolutomide, the third one that just was published a few weeks ago, we clearly postponed METS for at least more than half, one and a half year, close to two years. And this is also linked to a decrease, to a postponed uh, side effects of METS. Patients needed, needing some form of, of treatment for painful or symptomatic metastasis. Based on these trials, we suggested that for those men who are M0 CRPC, one of these three drugs is an absolutely valid option and a strong recommendation to consider. I, on that, I want to highlight the fact that M0 is defined by bone scan and CT scan only, and that the PET PSMA or PET coline has absolutely no place there. We have nothing regarding any data on survival and outcome based on that. The very last major change comes from the newly diagnosed M1 disease, Probably you remember last year we had two new things, that is adding docetaxel on top of ADT or adding ABI on top of ADT for newly diagnosed M1 disease. Now with the third arm to consider that is adding radiotherapy that comes from subgroup analysis stampede that was pre-planned, so it's correct to analyze it independently, that for patients for the low volume disease based on charted definition, uh, adding radiotherapy to the prostate adds survival. So we have now three standards for low volume disease, adding radiotherapy, adding ABI, also adding docetaxel, which still is a standard of care, even for the low risk disease. Low volume disease means no visceral metastasis and no bone metastasis outside the actual skeleton. So this is the definition of low volume disease. That's the four main points that are new in the guidelines.